I have a small goal this morning. You have given me your 18 minutes of your time, and 18 minutes from now, I'm going to make you a little wiser, a little smarter than now. I'm going to share my thoughts and wisdoms from my uh, scientific activity. I'm a synthetic biologist. Being a synthetic biologist, I'm dreaming about applying the principles of biology to create synthetic signals in the body or synthetic life forms. Let me start off, to address this, let me start off by telling you what is actually killing us. I'm using uh, American uh, statistics to illustrate these points. What's shown here are the cause of death before you naturally die, and you can see a number of uh, things uh, that you're familiar with. You may have already noticed that the most three common reasons to, to die are those infectious diseases. This is the data from 1900, about 100 years ago. As of today, year 2010, you can see a different list of uh, cause of death here. And you may have already noticed that those diseases that you noticed that I grayed out here is uh, infectious disease. And those diseases, diphtheria or uh, pneumonia or those uh, tuberculosis, those infectious diseases have essentially been eradicated and thanks to the discovery of antibiotics and vaccines. And this is a remarkable achievement by medical doctors and drug industry. Actually, it happened for the first time in the human industry that the life expectancy, average life expectancy, has increased from about 47 years, 100 years ago, to about 79 years as of today. Now, if you look at the list of things that are killing us today are difficult diseases, cancers, cardiovascular disease. These are not caused by infection. These are caused by breakdown of internal systems. Cellular messaging systems inside your body are going, uh, are going down and break down, and that's when this disease starts to uh, uh, occur. And a couple of other diseases that you noticed are underlined in red, suicides, Alzheimer's, diabetes, these are lifestyle uh, diseases. So these diseases are very difficult to address. And possibly if, if we manage to uh, cure these diseases, can we actually aim or desire to live even longer? Have you actually thought about living longer to 150 years or more? But more importantly, the real important question is, if you were given 150 years or uh, 200 years or even as long as you want, what kind of living is it going to be? And that's the, the topic that I'm going to talk about today. It, is it going to be a smart living or what kind of life is it going to be? And a lot of things are happening these days in the in biological field and that I'm going to highlight that this living longer is not a simple task. Actually, we, our genome is already designed to terminate our body after about 100 years or so. This was discovered about 50 years ago by a scientist, Leonard Hayflick, at the University of Pennsylvania. In the laboratory, he discovered that cells that make up our body actually stop dividing after about 50 times. And it was very peculiar phenomena. Why do they stop dividing and die, uh, and die? That means our physical limitations are already imposed. We cannot live forever. And this mystery was partly uh, solved when Elizabeth Blackburn at UC San Francisco discovered that the tip of our chromosome is actually called telomere, and this telomere is getting shorter and shorter. Whenever cells divide, it gets shorter. So after about 50 cell divisions, you have no more telomere left. And that's our body starts to break down, and no, we cannot uh, live any longer. So, you, so the challenge, you may have hoped a couple of minutes ago that you may be able to live 300 years or longer, but it's not that simple. It's not going to happen unless we do something about it. Okay. 
to get to that discussion, I'm going to remind you of three points from your high school biology. Just three points, okay? Our body is made up with 37 trillion cells. Give and take, 37 trillion cells. Point number two, each cell that makes up our body contains 23 pairs of chromosomes. And chromosome is where genetic material is stored. Remember that? And each of these DNA is made up with only four kinds of compounds. We call them bases. They are A, T, G, and C. Remember all this? OK, you're ready. OK, I'm going to highlight only two major breakthrough discoveries made in the past few decades in modern biology. In my mind, this was the turning point for modern biology when James Watson, American postdoc who went to uh, Cambridge University, uh, who worked with the Francis Crick, then a graduate student at Cambridge University, they together worked out a three-dimensional structure of DNA. DNA is made up with the two spirals, as you can see in, in the slides, and that, for the first time, with this visual confirmation of what DNA looks like, people have been able to sort out how genes are transferred from parents to children, how they are replicated, and how our characters are, are copied from uh, one generation to another. Actually, the biology, for the first time, faced a solid principle. In biology, it's very hard to find the principle. This is the principle that, you, that all life form on Earth are relying on. DNA is the blueprint of our life that transcribes into a RNA, and RNA is the messenger to translate into a protein, and protein is the component that circulates within your body to perform certain functions. And this central dogma is unshaken, and it's going to be the principle of life. The second major breakthrough discovery happened in 2000, around te about 10 years ago. It was it was a lucky case for Bill Clinton. It was towards the end of his term. In 2000, two uh, ma main uh, scientists, Craig Venter on the left and then Francis Collins, they announced the completion of human genome. Before then, we didn't really know for sure what we are made up with. After this work, we now know we are made up with three billion base pairs of A, T, G, and C. And that's the blueprint we have. That's what we are going to deal with to make a smart, smarter living. This is what happens during the process of what we call development. We all start out with a single embryo. You understand this, right? This single embryo goes through the process of developments. We call it developments. Through this process to turn into a tissue and a body, there are a number of developmental signals. The names are not important. Are, those are protein molecules that go around in your body to tell the cell to turn into a heart or pancreas or, or t skin, and that forms into a body. And this green arrow is unfortunately designed and blueprinted in your genome, and it's a one-way street. So if something goes wrong in your pancreas, you're going to have a diabetic conditions. If your heart stops working, then you will have a heart disease and skin problems, things like that. And those are the barriers we want to overcome. And the major, major uh, discovery, technological discovery, was made by a scientist almost single-handedly, his name is Yamanaka from Kyoto University, about uh, 10 years ago. And he was able to take one of these skin cells, uh, uh, differentiated uh, skin cells, and then induced a certain uh, set of genes called transcription factors by use of a virus, and then made it into a, almost like an embryo-like uh, cells. It's not exactly an embryo, it's a cell in a petri dish, but it works like an embryo. So that you have a second chance to restart this engine, go through the blue, uh, green arrow all over again, so that you now can have possibly fresh new tissue. If you happen to have a bad heart, then you can possibly create this uh, petri dish uh, cells and then differentiate back to a fresh new heart and put it back in your body. Now, that's something we can use of to make this uh, 
longer uh, smart living. What's missing, though, in this red arrow are the synthetic signals, signals that put this back on, on time, because nature has never intended to de-differentiate de back from skin cells back to uh, embryonic like embryo like cells so these synthetic signals are something that never existed in nature and that's when my research got really kicked in i was interested in attempting to see something we can do before i tell you about the second major breakthrough i spared one slide to illustrate ab204 highlighted in yellow it mimics BMP2. BMP2 is a natural signal that tells the cell to turn into bone. Can we do better than Mother Nature? And that technology is the first technology that I just told you about. Here's the bone, uh, the top of the skull of a mouse. We made a little hole, about five millimeter uh, diameter hole, and the hole, if the hole is too big, they don't fuse back. If you have a little crack, they generally fuse back. But adult bones are not that good in uh, repairing themselves. So after three months, it remains like a hole. With the BMP2, natural signals, soaked into a piece of sponge and put it onto that little hole, five millimeter hole. And then after three months, you can see uh, the big part of that hole has been sealed back. And you can see uh, x-ray photography underneath so that you can see a significant recovery. This is the synthetic signal that I created, AB204 with the 0.1 microgram. You notice it's a one-tenth of a material soaked in the same piece of sponge and, and put it onto that hole. You can see a much better recovery of the bone. Actually, this, it's too much. So probably you don't need even 0.1. You may need even maybe uh, be OK with a, uh, even 0.01 microgram. So synthetic signals that does better than nature, mother nature, is a possible thought. And I think people can realize that the, uh, we, are, we are not really bounded by uh, what uh, mother nature intended for, uh, through our genome. Now, the second technology. This is not my work, but this is very important. If you haven't heard about this, you should know this. It's, it's pronounced as CRISPR. CRISPR is a piece of DNA ori originally discovered by microbiologists. And by combining with this uh, uh, bacterial protein called K K uh, CAS and a piece of RNA that works as a guidance molecule, now we have a means technology that fixes, that changes each of these three billion bases one at a time. It's true. Your gene that's made up with the three billion base pairs can be changed at any place you want. Never happened. It was never possible. All these things happened because of this uh, the breakthrough technologies that happened starting from Watson and Crick's DNA structure and up until now. What it means is it's a great news for those who are born with a birth defect. Your gene, we, we typically have 8,000 different kinds of uh, 30,000 genes and 8,000 different kinds of uh, genetic disorders. You know, some people are born with the defects in certain enzyme because of one base has changed. It's called mutations. It happens in the cancer patients. When we discover that, we can zoom in into that one particular base on the strength, DNA strand that's three billion base pairs long and fix that, changing from either A T, G, and C to one of those right base. The alphabets of this genome is as simple as that, A, T, G, and C. It's made up with by four letters. So if, it, if we do this to a human, it's, it's a fantastic news. We can actually change those uh, genetic defects that you're born with. And some people may even wish to have a, a, a different characters. I want something, something, and I want uh, genetic changes. And this happened actually four months ago by Chinese scientists. They reported for the first time that this CRISPR-mediated technology was used to a human embryo so that human genome can be now edited. It's a very scary thought to some extent. Your gene can be edited, but it's coming. Combined with the stem cell technology that tracks back in time, you have a second chance to restart your developmental process. Now you now have a second technology that 
fixes or changes those genes. Even if you're born with A, you can have, you're, an, you're an adult, you can click those chains from A to G and then backtrack to an earlier embryonic state and restart your heart and you can have a new heart. Let me uh, end my uh, thoughts with the following two slides. Now it's, it's time to make some imaginations. 100 years from now, maybe 200 years from now, what kind of life would that be if our genes have been modified to live longer? I already told you our genomes are not designed to live long. It's already built to terminate after about 100 years, maybe 142 years or so. But with this new technologies called stem cell technologies and gene editing technologies, our life form will be somewhat different. It may not be our body, actually. It may be based on our genomes, but it may not be our body anymore. What scares me even more is what's the definition of me? Who am I? What am I? My uh, body doesn't really define me anymore. It's the brain that, that goes on, and you already heard several times that the, the framework, genetic framework, that builds the thoughts and the uh, characters or behaviors are built in a brain circuitry. And the physical framework of those brain circuitry is actually written out in, a, in the form of genes. So this scary thoughts was the, was the theme of a, a movie, 1998. The title is Gataka. I, ironically, this spells as G-A-T-T-A-C-A. -A. I think the director meant it that way. And from in, in this movie, director wanted to say something like this. He raised the, uh, the question, can our will play a part in uh, deciding our fate beyond our genes? In this movie, uh, Ethan Hawke is uh, born to be a second-class citizen, and then uh, Uma Thurman was born and engineered. Her gene was to, to become a, a, a upper-class citizen, and he fell in love with her, and he overcame the, the, this genetic barrier by the power of love. I don't fully understand <laughs> if it's gonna be the, the, the most uh, sensible solution to this, but to some extent, I share the thoughts that it's gonna be very, in a not too far distant uh, future, we will face a very profound question. What am I? In fact, even as of now, my body consists of 37 trillion cells, I told you, but it also contains more than 100 trillion bacterial cells in your guts, on your skin. So in a, in a nutshell, I'm 30% human and 70% bacteria. <laughs> it's true. So that's not really me. What if we start to change those body parts using stem cell technologies and CRISPR technology? Our body parts will be, uh, be derived from those uh, uh, synthetic materials. Is that me? Now the even scarier thoughts is artificial intelligence. When our brain activity was aided or fused to a circuitry aided by uh, uh, computer chips and algorithms, how much is me? And that's really difficult question to address in a simple way, but at least I think I gave you a right question to ponder on, and this is my thoughts, this is my solution. I'm not really defined by my body. I'm defined by the networks and impacts I make on my neighbors and friends. So thank you for being my friends and neighbors in my lifetime, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>